Luke chapter 20 is where we're going to find ourselves this morning. Um, and, and, and as we get into this, we're going to be camping this morning on the first 19 verses of this chapter, the first 19 verses. Um, but first, why don't we bow and, and come before the Lord and, and kind of prepare our hearts to receive today's message. And, and Father, that's, that's what we do this morning. We, we realize that we're not just coming to church. We're not just singing songs. We're not just going through motions. Lord, but we're, we're, we're coming into your presence. Lord, we, we, we're, we're, we're opening up the scripture. We're opening up your word. And we want you to speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, we, we live in desperate times. We live in, in times where, where our, our employment might be shaky. Our families might be shaky. Our marriages might be shaky. Our, our economy is shaky. The, the, everything around us. And, and, and what we need is the, the steady, stable uh, uh, conviction and truth that comes from your word. And so we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you would want to say to your church in this place this morning. So we bow before you, and we seek you in this place, and it's in Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me for a moment. Now, uh, as we get into chapter 20 this morning, the title of our message this morning is Done. D-O-N-E. Done. In fact, it's kind of funny. Uh, Years, a few years ago, my, my wife and I used to own a, a minivan, a, a, a Dodge Grand Caravan. And I, now, notice I said used to. I mean, we couldn't get rid of that thing fast enough. I mean, we, you talk about hating a vehicle. I mean, this thing, I mean, anyway, I mean, it was just crazy. I mean, there'd be times that we'd go and, and turn on the ignition, just, just turn the key, nothing. Nothing would happen. And, and then what was even crazier is that not only would we turn the key and nothing would happen, but the odometer, all the mileage would disappear from the odometer, and it would just say, Done. D-O-N-E. Oh, this can't be good. My car just told me it's done. <laughs> That's a true story. Now listen, it's one thing when, 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 when you've got a minivan and it's done with you and you're done with it, but what about when it's a person? I mean, let me ask you, you ever, you ever have a, a person in your life that you're done with? I mean, somebody in your life that you know, you, you're, just, you're just done. You know, maybe, maybe you, you were married to someone like this at one point in time, you know, and, and maybe they cheated on you, and, and maybe they cheated on you a, a few times. And, and yet, you know, over and over, you, you forgave them, and you kept forgiving them. And, and, and every time they would come to you, and they would say that they're sorry, and, and, and they would tell you that, that that's the last time. They're never going to do it again. And so you, 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 you take them back, but then finally they, they cheat on you again. And that's like that was the last straw, and, and you can't take it anymore. You're done. Or maybe it's a, a, a rebellious teenager. And, 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 you know, and, and maybe they start using drugs and they're stealing money from you and, 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 they, and they can't hold a job down. And you've come to your wits end with this kid and you just can't take it anymore. And so you draw a line in the sand and then they cross it. And so finally, it's like you're done. You're, you're done with them. Well, this morning, here in Luke chapter 20, we, we see that, that we can actually get to a place like that with God. That we can actually come to a point like that with God where finally God is like, he's done. He's done. So now first, as we pick it up in, in, in chapter 20, verse 1, we see that the leaders of, uh, of Israel, that is the religious leaders of Israel, they think that they're done with Jesus. They think that they're done with him. They've had enough. So chapter 20, verse 1, it says, now it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel that the chief priest and the scribes together with the elders c confronted him and spoke to him saying, tell us by, by what authority are you doing these things? Or, or who gave you this authority? But he answered and said to them, I also, also will ask you one thing and you answer me, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And so they reasoned among themselves saying, well, if we say it was from heaven, then he will say, why then did you not believe in him? But if we say it was from men, well, then all the people will stone us, for they, they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered and said that they did not know where it was from. And then Jesus said to them, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now let me set this up. Now, let me ask you, how many of you know someone who, who when they get hurt, when, when, they, when they get upset, when, when, when they get angry, how many of you know someone who, who when they get upset and they get hurt, they just, they, they just stew all day? They just stew on it all day. I mean, just, just mull it over and just think about it and think about it, and they won't let go. They just, all day long, I mean, maybe, maybe they, they plot and plan the whole day how they're going to get even with you, how they're going to make you pay. You know, you're thinking, I used to work with somebody like that. Some of you are thinking, I used to be married to somebody like that. 
uh, it's like the husband and wife I heard about who, who uh, one morning before work, they got in this, this huge fight. It's just a terrible fight. And, and now at one point, she needed help zipping up her dress because the zipper was in the back, but he was frustrated. So he grabbed that zipper as hard as he could, and he just zipped that thing up like five, six, seven different times, just as hard as he could, just to send her a message that, that he was frustrated. Zipped it up, stormed off, and went to work. Well, now, meanwhile, she stewed on this all day long. I mean, she couldn't get over this. She just thought about it and thought about it and thought about it until finally they, uh, she, she comes home later that afternoon from work. She sees her husband underneath the car uh, on the driveway working on the car. She thinks, oh, okay. She comes up and grabs a zipper on his pants and just five, six different times, just as hard as she could, and then storms off. Well, now you can imagine her surprise when she comes into the kitchen to see her husband in the kitchen drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> She's thinking, well, then who's, who's in the driveway? Well, as it turns out, the next-door neighbor was over helping work on the car. So now they run out, and they come to see what's going on. And, and this poor guy, he's out cold. Because when she grabbed a zipper, it kind of startled him. He sat up as fast as he could, hit his head on the transmission, and he was out. <laughs> but, but some people, I mean, they, they, they just stew, and, and they just fester, and, and they just plot, and they plan. Well, now, in the same way, we, we see that, that, that ever since the events that we read about last week, the religious leaders, in the same way, have, have been stewing. They've been plotting and planning how they're going to get back at Jesus. Because keep in mind, what we saw last week, that, that Jesus went, went into the temple, and, and he made this big old stinking scene, right? I mean, he's, he's kicking over tables, he's cracking a whip, and he's shouting at the top of his voice saying, you know what, my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And he drives them out with a whip. Well, in, in the process, Jesus not, not only embarrassed them, but more than that, he, he exposed the religious leaders for the frauds they really were. He, he exposed them because, you know, as we said last week, they, they were ripping the people off. They were using God's name to rip off the people, and, and Jesus had enough. And so he drove them out of their temple. And so ever since then, they've been plotting, and they've been planning, they've been stewing. In fact, it says ever since then, chapter 19, verse 47, that they sought to destroy him. Look at it. Chapter, uh, chapter 47, verse, verse 19, it says that the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. As I mentioned last week, th this word destroy doesn't mean to destroy his reputation. This wasn't character assassination. No, the, the, the Greek word, apolumi, that this, this is a word that, that can be translated literally, utterly destroy. Literally, it's translated kill, slay, murder. And so ever since then, they have been plotting and planning how they were going to murder Jesus. Now, in just a moment, as we continue in just a moment, we're going to see that Jesus goes on to tell a parable that, that, that not only confronts their motives, not, not only exposes their hearts, the, the murder that was in their heart, but ultimately he tells a parable that, 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 that shows that because his people, that is, uh, that the nation of Israel had repeatedly rejected him over and over and over again, this parable shows that, that if they're not careful, if they keep rejecting him, they're going to get to a point where he's done, where he's had enough. That if they keep rejecting him, he gets to a point where he's done. Now, from their perspective, from the perspective of the religious leaders, I mean, as far as they're concerned, you know, it was, it was bad enough that Jesus comes into their temple and kicks them out of, of their temple. But now on top of that, we see here in the opening verse of chapter 20, he then sets up shop in their temple and, and starts teaching daily and preaching the gospel. He sets up shop. He, he takes over. And so now they come in all huffy and puffy. And they're like, you know, where do you get off? I mean, who do you think you are? Who gave you the authority to do this? Now, listen, you have to understand that the religious leaders in those days were all about authority. They were all about, that is, having the, the right credentials, the right qualifications. In fact, listen, the, the, the rabbis in, in those days Whenever they taught, whenever they spoke, they never spoke in their own authority, but rather that they would quote another rabbi. And so they, they would quote like, you know, they'd say, well, Rabbi Gamaliel says, Rabbi Hillel says, Rabbi so-and-so says. 
And so they always, you know, used someone else's authority. Now, not only that, but, but you know, they, they were also really big into credentials. And they'd say, well, you know, scholar so-and-so gave me my, my certificate, gave me my credentials, you know, gave me my certificate of ordination. And so, you know, they, you know all these rabbis, they, 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 they were all trained in the, in the finest rabbinical institutions, and all of them wanted to graduate at the top of their class, you know, rabbi cum laude. <laughs> You know, they, they wanted to, to reach the top of their class. And so now, Jesus comes along, and they're like, well, what about you? Where, where, where's your certificate? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, what are your credentials? Who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? And now Jesus, just like the rabbis of that day would often do, Jesus answers their question with a question. And he says, well, hey, before I answer your question, riddle me this. You know, the, the John the Baptist. Who gave John the Baptist his authority? Because obviously he didn't have the right credentials. Obviously he didn't have a certificate. He didn't graduate rabbi cum laude. So who gave John the Baptist his credentials? Now these guys were, were smart enough to realize that this was a setup. This was a trick question. And so they're basically like, hey, uh, don't ask, don't tell. You know, like, you know, th this is a trap. This is a trick question. I mean, no matter, no matter how we answer the question, he's got us either way. So the best answer is no answer at all. And so now Jesus turns and says, well, okay, fine. If you're not going to tell me, then I won't tell you. If, if you're not going to answer my question, I'm not going to answer your question. And so now as we continue, now Jesus is going to paint two word pictures to illustrate their hearts. Two word pictures to illustrate how they were rejecting him. Now, the, the first parable here in verse 9 is, is the parable of the rebellious vine dressers. The rebellious vine dressers. Verse 9, Then he began to tell the people this parable, saying, A certain man planted a vineyard and then leased it to vine dressers and went, at, and went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they may give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But, but the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third. And, 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 and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then the owner of the field or of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I'll, uh, I'll send my beloved son. Probably they'll respect him when, when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they, they, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Come, let, let's kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of that vineyard do to them? He will come and, and destroy those, those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And, and when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Now, by the way, you have to understand as, as we read this parable, Jesus was, was using an, an image, using a picture that was that was very, very common, very understood. And the reason it was so understood was because of a, of a law way back in the Old Testament, way back in, in Leviticus chapter 19. Because way back in Leviticus chapter 19, we have this law about, about the vineyard owner. And according to Leviticus 19, uh, the, the vineyard owner was not allowed to harvest the fruit of his vineyard until the fifth year, until the fifth year. Now, here's the way it worked. The way it worked was that during the first three years, the, 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 the fruit was just to sit there. The, the, you, know, you, were, you were to cultivate, you were to take care, you were to, you were to weed and, and make sure you took care of everything, but you were not allowed to harvest any of the fruit. The fruit just sat there on the vine. And then finally, on the fourth year, finally, you would be allowed to, to harvest the fruit, but you had to give all of that fruit as a tithe to the Lord. 100% of it went to the Lord. You, you couldn't keep any of it for yourself. And then finally, on the fifth year, that was the year that you'd be allowed to, to harvest the fruit and keep the fruit for yourself. Now, typically, the, the, the way it worked, it was a common practice in those days for the vineyard owner to, to then kind of hire out, to, to rent his vineyard to, 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 to vine growers, or as they're called here, vine dressers. Because typically these, 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 these landowners, they owned more than one vineyard, and, and they were all over the place, and so they, they had to rent out. And now, uh, you, 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 would, you would lease it out to, to people who would cultivate it and tend it and take care of it for you. But 
in order for, for, the, for the owner to, to retain ownership of his property, he had to, to, to get a sample of the, of the fruit, a sample of the produce from the, the renters, from the vine dressers. And so, so the owner would often send a servant to just, just, just to collect a sample, just, even if it was just a few grapes, just a sample. Because if he didn't collect that sample, if he just ignored his property and just kept ignoring it and kept ignoring it, well, then the renters, the, the vine dressers, they, they could say, well, this is a negligent owner. In fact, you know, I don't, we don't know what's happened to the guy. He, he might have died for all we know. We've been doing all the work. We've been taking care of the whole thing. And so, you know what? We, we, want, we, we want ownership. We do all the work. We should be able to keep the produce. And so they could make a, a claim for, for ownership of, of, of the land. And so uh, this explains why when, when the owner sends his servants, the tenants, the, the renters, the, 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 the vine dressers, beat the servants and send them away. They're trying to say, hey, this guy never came. We, we never saw these guys. They just keep sending them away. Why? Because they're hoping that they can make a land grab. They're hoping that they can, they can grab this, this, this vineyard for themselves. I mean, you talk about problem renters. <laughs> but, but, but again, this is a parable. And a parable is, a, is an earthly story with, with, a, with a spiritual lesson. So we have to read this and, and wonder, what's the spiritual lesson? I mean, as we read this parable, how do we interpret it? What, what, you know, what, what do all these things mean? You know, for example, we have to ask, you know, who or, or what does the vineyard represent? And for that matter, uh, who do, do, do the vine dressers represent? Or, or who do the, do, the, do the servants represent? And for that matter, who, who, who does the owner of the vineyard represent? And as you know, many of you know, that, that oftentimes it's best to interpret Scripture with Scripture, right? So now back in the Old Testament, back in Isaiah chapter 5, we have a very similar parable. And now this is a parable of a, of a vineyard owner who, 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 who you know, he gets this ground and, and he works it and he planted it and he, and he, and he tended it and he took care of it and he, and he just kept taking care of it. And finally, at harvest time, he's expecting to find a, a good harvest. He's expecting to come and, and find plump, juicy grapes but instead he comes and he finds nothing but weeds and thorns and he gets angry he gets so angry that he he destroys his whole field he just burns the whole thing up now isaiah gives us the interpretation because in isaiah chapter 5 isaiah tells us who uh, the, the different characters are in fact he tells us who for example the vineyard represents in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, for example, it says that the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And so, and so in, in Isaiah's parable, the vineyard represented the nation of Israel, the house of Israel. And then obviously the, the owner of the vineyard, that's, that's the Lord himself, the Lord of hosts. And so if we, we, if we take Isaiah's definition and now fast forward over here to Luke chapter 19, then in the same way, we see that in this parable, obviously the, the vineyard in this parable, that would be the nation of Israel as well. And then obviously the, the owner of the vineyard, that would be God himself. And so then obviously the, the, the son of the owner, that would be Jesus Christ. But then who are, who are the vine dressers? Well, the vine dressers, th those, th th those would be the, the religious leaders of the day religious leaders of the day who, who God entrusted with his field. God entrusted with his people, Israel. He entrusted uh, the, them to the religious leaders so that they could cultivate them and tend them and take care of their spiritual needs. Well, then who are, are the servants in this parable? Well, in my opinion, I think the servants in this parable would be the prophets from the Old Testament. Because again, as, as, we, as we read the Old Testament, we see that, that the nation of Israel, they, they have this long history where, where they, they, would, they would be unfaithful to God. You know, there were times that they were faithful to God, but then all of a sudden they would be unfaithful. They would worship false gods. And so then God would, would send a messenger, God would send a, a prophet uh, to them to, to tell them to repent, to turn the hearts of the people back to God. But instead, when, when these messengers came, they would often beat the messenger. And in many cases, kill the messenger. For example, we know that the prophet Jeremiah had been beaten a number of times and then and thrown into a dungeon. We know that the prophet Isaiah had been sawn in half. We know that the prophet Zechariah was stoned to death. We, and we also know that John the Baptist was beheaded. These were messengers of God, and, and they were just serving the Lord. They were bringing his message, but they shot the messenger. <laughs> and this just reminds us that, you know what? Serving the Lord isn't easy. <laughs> 
Yeah, because when you step out and you serve the Lord, you know what? You might get rejected. When you step out and you serve the Lord, you, you might be misunderstood. I mean, you know, you, you step out and your intentions are great, but they misunderstand you and sometimes even attack you. I don't know how your, how your imagination works. I had a friend who used to call it your sanctified imagination. But here's how mine works. You know, sometimes I, I, I picture myself, you know, in heaven one day, and I get to meet some of these guys, these, these legends of the faith, like the prophet Isaiah, could you imagine? Or, or, or Jeremiah, or Elijah, or, or Zechariah. You know, I could just imagine them talking with me and, and telling me how hard it was in their day to serve the Lord as they're showing me their wounds from all the beatings and floggings and, and, then, and, and, and talking about how they were beheaded or sawn in half. And then I can imagine them looking at me and saying, you know, what about you? What about you in your day? How hard was it for you to serve the Lord in your day? I'd be like, oh, man, in my day? Oh, yeah, I mean, when I'd serve the Lord, whenever I said something people didn't like, they, they, they would email me. <laughs> you wuss. It reminds me of John Wesley back in the 1800s. He was training a, a group of preachers. And as he was training these young men for the ministry, he would then send them out to preach. But when they came back, he would ask them two questions. He would say, number one, did anyone get saved? Number two, number two, <laughs> did, did anyone get angry? Did anyone get saved? Did anyone get angry? And if the answer to those questions was no, well, then he would tell them they weren't called to the ministry. They weren't cut out for this. Go find an easier line of work. He said, if, if no one's getting saved and no one's getting angry, you're not called. <laughs> it's not easy to serve the Lord. But in this parable, ultimately we see that, 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 that this was a group who had rejected the owner. They, 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 and ultimately this is a group that, that re rejected their God. They rejected his word. They rejected his prophets, his messengers. And ultimately they rejected his son. And now Jesus paints a second word picture. And that's the picture, as I pick it up in verse 17, of, of the rejected stone. The rejected stone. Verse 17. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the, which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever, uh, f whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind them into powder. So now Jesus here is quoting from a Psalm 118, verse 22. But, but he mentions the chief cornerstone, or some of your English translations say the capstone. It's the same thing. It's the capstone because it would go on the top. You see, when, when you're in, in a building project, like maybe building the temple in Israel, for example, then, 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 then the last thing you would do is, is you would put on the, the chief cornerstone or the capstone, and, and, and it would fit literally right in the corner. And, it was, and it, was, it was done in such a way that it would literally hold everything together. It held everything, it locked everything together. And so literally without the capstone, without the chief cornerstone, the whole thing would come apart. Now, now here's the story. The story. Legend, legend, legend has it, as, as, they, as, were as they were building, building the temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem they, would they would chisel out, out these, these, these huge stones, stones and down, and at, the down at the rock quarry, quarry and, 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 and which, which, which was several miles, miles away from the temple mountain, 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 now, as now, the legend goes, goes uh, 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 they were in the they were middle of this building this project, project, when all of a sudden, the, sudden the, 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 the rock quarry, quarry sent, sent the cap stone, the, 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 the chief the corner stone, too early. early. And, so and so when it showed up, 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 it showed it looked like like the other stones there, it looked weird and out of place. So they just figured it was some kind of manufacturer's defect, and literally threw it away. They literally went to a place called the Kidron Valley and threw it away. Well, no, a little bit later. later. They, they, they finish they up the finish project, project, and now they're looking for the chief cornerstone. They're, they're looking for the capstone, and they can't find it. So they so message to the to the rock the quarry, and they say, hey, where's, hey, where's the capstone? The capstone. And the quarry the messages the back and says, well, we sent that a long time ago. And that's when they realized that they had rejected, and they had thrown away the most important part, the one stone that would have locked and held everything together. Now, in the same way, uh, a little bit later, in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, the, the apostle Peter says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. That that stone represents him. 
that just as the builders rejected the most important part of the temple, the, the one part that held the whole thing together, in the same way they had rejected Jesus. Warren Wiersbe often says that if you're wrong about Jesus, then you're wrong about everything. And listen, that's true. That's true because, listen, w without Jesus Christ in your life, you have a life that's on the verge of falling apart because he's the capstone. He's the cornerstone. And without him locking you together, without him in your life, you're going to come unglued. You're going to fall apart at any moment. Without, if, if you're wrong about Jesus, you're wrong about everything. So as we pick it up in this last verse, we see that, that Jesus has really gone from preaching to meddling. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean the, verse 1 tells us that he was, he was teaching in the temple and preaching the gospel, but when the religious leaders show up, now he goes from preaching to meddling. Yeah, and, and you know the difference, right? You, sometimes you go to church and you hear a sermon. Sometimes you go to church and you hear preaching. Other times you go to church and, and, and it's like the sermon is, is meddling in things that you don't want meddled. You know, dealing with stuff in your life, dealing with stuff that you don't want dealt with. And that's what's happening here. And so in verse 19, and the chief priest and the scribes, that very hour, sought to lay hands on him. That does not mean they wanted to pray for him. They, they were looking for violence. Uh, they, uh, they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. <laughs> and so just as the vine dressers killed, killed the son in the same way that the religious leaders want to kill Jesus. And, and then just as, as, as the cornerstone had been rejected by the builders, in the same way Jesus had been rejected by his own people by his own people. Even as it says in, in John 1, 11, he came to his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected by his own. Now listen, this point was not lost on the religious leaders. It wasn't lost on them. They knew exactly what he was talking about. It even says, they knew that he spoke this parable against them. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Ever go to church sometimes, and, and as you're at church, ever have ha, ever, ever feel like like the preacher's talking just to you, like you're the only one in the room, like he's been reading your email? Well, you know what? In this case, he really was talking just to them. He was confronting them, and they knew it, and they didn't like it. And yet, rather than repent, instead they they hardened their hearts and they sought to kill him. They they want to destroy him. Now, with that, by the way, let's not forget that the people of Israel, the, that is the nation of Israel, and by the way, when I say the nation of Israel, I mean in, in biblical times, in ancient biblical times, don't forget that the, the nation of Israel kind of had this, this long history of, of rejecting God, right? I mean, we see this throughout the Old Testament, you know, where they would go through these cycles where, where on, on one occasion they would be faithful to God, but then on another occasion they, they would turn their backs on God and, and worship pagan gods. And, 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 they, and they were unfaithful. And so God got to the point where he would allow the, their, their enemies to conquer them and even enslave them. Which, by the way, that, that's why they were currently, at the writing of Luke, currently enslaved to the Roman Empire at the moment. But then before that, back in 586 B.C., the, the southern kingdom of Judah was, was, was invaded and then ultimately captured by, by Babylon, right? Remember King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians? And they enslaved the people of, 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 of the Jews for, for 70 years. But then before that, in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel was invaded and captured by Assyria. And this goes on and on, example after example, time after time again. And it all this goes back to a promise that God made his people back in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And when you read Deuteronomy 28, you see that this is a chapter of blessing and cursing. A chapter of blessing and cursing. Because on the one hand, God's telling his people that if, that if they are faithful to him and they do keep his commands, he's going to bless them. But at the same time, he promises them and tells them that if, that if they're unfaithful to him, if, if, if they rebelled, if they worship other gods, if, if they reject him, well, then they're going to have to face the consequences. They're, they're going to reap what they've sown. He, he's going to allow their enemies to conquer them and ultimately enslave them. 
In fact, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning right around verse 64, God tells them that, 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 that he's, if they reject him, he's going to scatter them uh, among the nations from one end of the earth to the other, and it'll get to the point where they no longer have a nation that they can call their own. And then he sums it all up in the very last verse of Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68, God says, And the Lord will, will take you, you back to Egypt in ships, by, by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies, male and female, as, as slaves. But no one will buy you. So God's promising him. He's, he's saying, you know what? If, if you keep rejecting me and you keep rejecting me, not only will I scatter you uh, among the nations, not only will you get to the point where you have no nation to call your own, but you'll get to a point where I actually sell you back to Egypt as slaves. And so again and again and again, we see that the people would turn their backs on God. But then again and again, God would raise up a prophet, a messenger, to, to, to warn the people, to try to get the people to repent. And yet instead of repenting, instead, what did they do? They beat the prophets. They even killed them in many cases. And so then ultimately, he sends his only begotten son. And they killed him, just like the parable said. Listen, it's been well said that a nation birthed by God will cease to be a nation at all when it rejects its God. And that's exactly what happened. Because first, they rejected his word, then they rejected his messengers, the prophets, and ultimately, they rejected their Messiah. And so, as, as we mentioned last week, in the year 70 AD, the, the, the Roman emperor Titus rolls into Jerusalem, completely destroys the city of Jerusalem, destroys the temple there in Jerusalem, and then he, he then murders, slaughters 1.1 million Jews there in the city of Jerusalem as well. And then he goes on to, to enslave 100,000 or so more and, and put them into slavery. But then over the years, uh, things, relations between the, the, the Jewish people and, and the Romans just kept getting worse and worse. And worse and worse, until finally, in the year 135 A.D., 135 A.D., the Roman emperor Hadrian, Yo, Hadrian! <laughs> the Roman emperor Hadrian uh, ends up selling countless thousands of the Jews to Egypt as slaves. Do you remember what, what God promised his people in Deuteronomy 28? Did he not promise them that if they keep rejecting him and keep rejecting him, not only will he scatter them, not only will they no longer have a nation of their own, but he will actually sell them back to Egypt as slaves? That promise was kept. That promise was literally fulfilled in the year 135 A.D. by the Roman emperor Hadrian. Now, Hadrian then took it a step further. He, he then wanted to rub salt in their rooms, wounds and just rub their face in it. So then what he did was he changed the, the name of their nation from Israel to the name of, of their most mortal and, 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 and hated enemy, the Philistines. He, he, he changed the name. He changed it from Israel to, to the Latin word or, or Roman word, Palestine. Palestine is, is the Roman or Latin name for Philistine. But you have to understand that at that time, in 135 A.D., there were no Philistines. They were extinct. They had been extinct for hundreds of years. They no longer existed. They were a dead people. They, they, they didn't exist. He wasn't giving this land to a certain group of people. He changed it to the name of their mortal enemies. Remember, Goliath was a Philistine. He changed it to their mortal enemies to rub their faces in it. And so he changed it to the, to the Latin word for Philistine, Palestine. You know, this is interesting, because even today in the news, you turn on CNN and you, and you always hear about the, about the Israelis and the Palestinians. But listen, there are no Palestinians. They do not exist. They have been extinct for thousands and thousands of years. And when they were in existence, they weren't in that part of the land. It, it, was, it, was, it was a name used to, to rub their noses in it, rub their faces in it, to put salt in the wound. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that these things happened to them as examples for us. And just th 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 these things were all because of, of a promise, of a covenant promise that God made with, with his people, the nation of Israel. But even though th this was a promise between him and them, there's still things for us to learn from it. These things happened to them as examples 
for us. And so on that note, let me say that, that right now, our country, we happen to be in the midst of, a, of an election year. <laughs> Did anybody not know that we're in the midst of an election year? You know, and, and listen, I know that right now some of you, I mean, you have a candidate, and, and, and you're going to vote for this candidate, and some of you are very excited and very passionate about the candidate that you have, and, I, and I'm happy for you. But I also know that, that a lot of you don't have a candidate, and a lot of you are not excited. Now, I don't know how many of you got, got to hear this, but this past week on Wednesday, I, I had the wonderful opportunity to, to, to co-host a, a radio show on, on 94.7 uh, FM, KRKS. It's a radio show called... Uh, uh, what is it called? It's, uh, Crosswalk. It used to be hosted by, 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 our, by our good friend Gino Geraci until he retired a couple weeks ago. And so uh, my, my friend Daryl Wilmoth, who, who pastors uh, Ro- uh, uh, Front Range Calvary, uh, we got to host a show. Actually, he was the host. I was just the, co- the, the uh, comedy relief. <laughs> But as, as we were, you know, uh, hosting the show, we, we talked about the election, and we had all these different people call in, all these calls, you know, and, and people were, were stressed out and, and worried and anxious about this and, 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 and you know, just, just really, really worried, and they didn't know what they were going to do. Can I just say that, and, and pardon me for saying it, but can I just say that it seems to me that a lot of us are suffering from, from electile dysfunction? It's true. I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just nervous, and we're anxious, and we're so worried. In fact, listen to this. According to the American Psychological Association, more than half of all Americans say that, that this upcoming election is, is stressing them out. Half of all Americans are suffering from, from chronic depression and chronic anxiety because of the upcoming election. They're worried. They don't know who they're going uh, to pick. They literally have electile dysfunction. They're, they're just stressed out. And, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, because they don't know who they're going to vote for. I mean, you know, they look at it and they're like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, both candidates seem to have character flaws. And as far as I'm concerned, they're like, you know what, there's scandals on both sides. And so we hear people at Starbucks say things like, well, you know what, I'm just going to vote for the lesser of two evils. Other people say things like, well, you know what, I'm not going to vote at all. Which, by the way, I don't think that's a good idea. But, but listen, can I just say that, that in the midst of all this dysfunction, in the midst of all this anxiety and all the stress and all the worry, can I just say that, that we do not have a political problem? We have a spiritual problem. A spiritual problem. Because listen to this. There's not a political candidate out there who's going to make America great again. Only God is going to make America great again. I like the way Billy Graham put it. Now, this was years ago, back in the 50s, on his old black and white TV show called Hour of Decision. And Billy Graham said, quote, I am absolutely convinced that no matter who's elected president, America is not going to be saved unless we have a moral and spiritual revival. That's my Billy Graham. (laughs) And you know what? I agree. I agree. We need a revival. We need a, a spiritual awakening. Now, listen, there, there have been some, some great spiritual awakenings in, in our country, in, in our history. And you know what? I think we need one more. We need a revival. Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but lately, recently, we as a nation have, have developed a history of rejecting our God. You know, back in 1962, 63, we, we took God out of the classroom. And then we took God out of the courtroom. And then we took God out of the pledge. And, and, then, and, then, and then we started legalizing things that, that, that God's word, the, the Bible, uh, speaks very clearly about. Whether it was Roe versus Wade or, or more recently the, 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 the ruling on same-sex marriage or whatever it is. But we have, a, we have established that as a nation, we are developing a history of rejecting our God. And again, to quote Billy Graham, but this time I'll spare you the impersonation. Billy Graham said, you know what? Sometimes we get the leadership we deserve. And it could be that that after a history, decade after decade of rejecting God, we as a nation might be reaping what we're sowing. And that could have something to do with the choices that are before us. Now listen, at the same time, it could be so easy for us to point the finger. So easy for us to point the finger and say, we know our culture is the way it is. Our society, we have the problems that we have because of Hollywood. Or we, we, we have the problems that we have because of, because of Washington or because of the liberal media. No, hold on, wait a minute. Listen, as, as I read the Bible, doesn't it seem that, that whenever God wants to do something, whenever God wants to make a change, 
Where does he point his finger? He points his finger at his own people, doesn't he? At his people. I mean, doesn't your Bible say in 1 Peter 4.17, for the time has now come that judgment begins in the house of God? It starts with us. It starts with his people. Listen, if there's going to be revival in this land, it doesn't start with the White House. It starts with his house. It starts with, with his people. And it could be that, 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 that some of us, we, we've given in to the pressure to be silent. Some of us are no longer shining as light in the darkness. Some of us are no longer salt on the earth. In fact, the, the statistics say that, that the divorce rate is just as high now in the church as it is in the world. That pornography is actually higher in the church than it is in the world. And that drug use is just as high. Alcoholism is just as high. Could it be that, that there's no longer dis, dis, a distinction between God's people and the people of this world? G. Campbell Morgan used to say that the church pure is the church powerful. If there's going to be a revival, it starts here. Isn't that why the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and, and forgive their sin and heal their land. Listen, if there's going to be healing in this land, if there's going to be revival in this land, it starts here. It doesn't start with those people. It starts with his people who humble themselves. Speaking of revival, the evangelist Gypsy Smith once said, you know what, if you want a revival, then, then go into your room, close the door, sit on the floor, and draw a circle around yourself. And then pray and ask God to revive everything inside that circle. It starts here with each of us. And so we don't need to be militant. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to protest this. We, we need to repent as the church. We need to turn to him. We need to be the body of Christ. And, and quit living like the world and quit living for worldly gain and worldly pleasure. We need to, to be who God's called us to be. But here, here's the good news. Yes, we've had a history of, of rejecting our God. And yes, there does come a point, as we learned this morning, that if you keep rejecting him and keep rejecting him and keep rejecting him, he might come to a point where he's done. But I believe that there's hope. That if his people cry out to him, if his people humble themselves, I believe there could be a revival. But it starts here. With us. Am I right? So, Father, we, we do. We, we surrender to you this morning. Lord, forgive us for, 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 for losing our distinction. Maybe not every one of us in this room, but, but definitely as a, as a whole, the church, the body of Christ, Lord, we, 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 know, we, we look a lot like the world around us. We live like them. We, we, we think like them. We, we want what they want. Shouldn't it be the other way? Lord, shouldn't they look at us and want what we have? Shouldn't they see that we've got something that they don't and want what we've got? Lord, forgive us for no longer shining as light in the darkness, being salt in this world, making people thirsty for what you've got. And so we do, we pray for healing in this land. We pray for revival, but we pray that you would start with, with me, that you would start with us. Revive us, re, 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 renew in us the joy of our salvation. Because Lord, if we're not excited about you, then why would they be? If we're not serving you and not living for you, then why would they want to? So start here. Clean your house. Revive your body that this world could be changed. We pray in Jesus' name. Why don't we stand and worship the Lord?